Welcome everyone. Just gonna give everyone a few minutes just to come on in and get their audio connected. So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Gemma. I represent Engineers Geoscientists Manitoba and I'll be the moderator for this session. First, I'd like to acknowledge that this session is being broadcast from Treaty 1 territory, the territory of the Anishinaabe, the Nahia, the Oji Cree, the Dakota and the Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. Much of our food for local consumption and export is grown on Treaty 1 and Treaty 2 territory. Our drinking water comes from Treaty 3 territory and our hydropower comes from and through Treaty 1, 2, 3 and 5 territory, enabling us to be here virtually with you today. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few basic Zoom housekeeping items. This session is being recorded by NEM Ontario and will be posted on their public YouTube channel. Before we end this session, there'll be a very short poll question put on the screen. So please stick around to the very end so that we can get some feedback about how you find this session and how useful it is. After today's presentation, Kim will do a short question and answer session. So please do send us any questions that you have at any time via the chat function that you can find on your screen. It's now my great pleasure to welcome our presenter today, Kimberly Dodds, who will be speaking on the topic of an engineer's perspective of organizational behavior. Kim is the executive director of Manitoba's Eye and Tissue Bank, a human tissue gift agency, which recovers tissues from authorized donors for transplantation, medical education, and scientific research. Kim, uh, she is a professional bioengineer with a master's of business administration. Kim has worked across Canada and internationally in both the private and public healthcare sectors in industries ranging from nuclear pharmaceuticals to point of, say, a point of care medical diagnostics. In addition to her role at Manitoba's Eye and Tissue Bank, Kim teaches in the Health Services Leadership and Management Program at Red River College. Kim, thank you so much for joining us today. It's over to you. Thanks, Gemma, for that lovely introduction. And thank you all for joining me this morning for our virtual presentation on organizational behavior from an engineer's perspective, uh, developing your soft skills. As Gemma indicated, my name is Kimberly Dodds, and it is my pleasure to be speaking with you today. I have over the last several years had the great privilege of instructing organizational behavior at Red River College here in Manitoba in their health services leadership and management program and look forward to sharing with you today some of my perspectives on this social science through my engineering lens. So what is organizational behavior? In its most simplistic form, organizational behavior, or OB, is the study of what people think, feel, and do in and around organizations. It looks at employee behavior, decisions, perceptions, and emotional responses. It examines how individuals and teams relate to each other and their counterparts in organizations and how organizations interact with their external environments. With such a lengthy definition, that begs the question, what are we going to focus on today? So today I'd like to spend some time with you talking about the soft skills related to leadership and management. This will dovetail a bit on presentations you've had earlier this month. Um, leadership and management is something that can serve all of us better in our careers and the world at large. And while I am certainly aware that we can debate the differences between these two terms at length, for the purpose of today's talk, we'll use them interchangeably. So where does our journey begin? As the great physicist Niels Bohr once quoted, an expert is a person who has found out by his own painful experience all the mistakes that can be made in a very narrow field. The one thing I can say with certainty is although at this point in my career, I'm in a position of senior leadership, I still have many mistakes to make. The objective of today's talk is to share with you some of my own mistakes, as well as some practical tips to help you avoid them and ease your journey. The Global Leadership and Organizational Behavior Effectiveness Forum describes leadership as influencing, motivating, and enabling others to contribute towards the effectiveness and success of the organizations of which they are members. I think organizations sometimes struggle to set up their leaders for success. You would not ask an engineer to model a complex flow equation without giving them the appropriate software. 
Why then do we promote people into leadership and management positions without providing them the training and tools required for success? Which is why I'm so glad that so many of you have turned in, tuned in to listen to these wonderful seminars uh, here through NEM Ontario. Much of what we'll talk about today will not be novel, but it never hurts to be reminded of the basics. We all know the importance of the base of any structure. That leads me to four characteristics that I consider fundamental and foundational elements of any good leader. Communication, delegation, authenticity, and decisiveness. While this list is not exhaustive, spending time focusing on these areas will certainly increase your effectiveness as a leader or manager in your organization. So let's jump into communication. It is foundational in how we interact with those around us in our workplaces and the world at large. I'd like to start off by telling you a story about one of my own failures in communication. Like many of you, last summer I was sticking close to home and decided to paddle a local whitewater river, the Manigatagan. Now I brought along a couple of my closest friends who had varying degrees of whitewater experience, which ranged from swift water rescue experts to those whose greatest previous whitewater experience was someone splashing too hard in the paddling pool. So we get to the first rapid, a quick class one, two combo, not too bad. It was spring and the water was high, so a bit chilly, but very manageable. My friend Monica was in the bow of the first canoe to go through the rapid, and she had never been in whitewater before. So we give her a quick tutorial, and I say, if you flip and fall out, make sure that you go down the rapid feet first, and be sure to keep your feet up. The purpose of this message is primarily for safety, the idea being to kick rocks with your feet as opposed to hitting them with your head. A few minutes later, Monica and her partner were off, and 30 seconds after that, they were swimming. Five seconds later, as the water swept her quickly by us and down the rapid, the four of us standing on shore were somewhat surprised by Monica's choice of floating position. I'd like you to take a moment and picture your most flexible friend, that friend who loves yoga, not the friend who struggles to touch their toes. I had instructed Monica to float down the rapid feet first and keep her feet up. My intended message was that she keep her feet level with the water. Her received message was to promptly bend at the waist at a 90 degree angle and lift her feet as high as possible into the air, sunning her soles, presenting them to the sky, presumably to even out her tan. As such, she proceeded down the rapid bum first feet to the sky. Communication matters. So what went wrong in this scenario? If you're the prototypic engineer, you likely have a blunt communication style. While working with similar individuals who share the same coding system as you, this may not be an issue. But I'd like you to picture a time when you tried to communicate a message to a colleague, a partner, and you thought there was no issue. You may have just been sharing facts, data, content, or plain old feedback. But when you were done, the recipient was confused frustrated or at worst angry. Let me tell you, Monica did not appreciate how her morning of tapping rocks with her behind later affected sitting in the canoe for five more days. <laughs> to be a superior communicator, we need to understand the interpersonal models of good communication. If you think of this in terms of a process flow diagram, you can picture yourself, the sender, forming a message which transmits through a conduit to the receiver your colleague. The challenge is the conduit through which the message flows, it's not clear. It gets disrupted by noise. That noise could be from many things, the environment, psychological or social barriers, structural barriers, anything that disrupts the sender's intended message. If any portion of that message gets distorted, it's possible that the sender and the receiver will not have a common understanding of what is being communicated. So how do we ensure that the information that we are communicating is received in the manner intended? Are we working from the same code books? What is the sender's ability to encode the message to their intended audience? 
and what is the audience's ability and motivation to receive it. It's important that when communicating, we find something that is shared. For example, a shared mental model, motivation, ability, or experience. I was surprised when I first became involved in writing press releases for my organization that this literature meant for public consumption was to be written at a grade eight reading level. And I am ashamed to say that I balked at this idea at first. Why should I degrade my illustrious vocabulary for those readers? If there is a word they don't know, they can look it up. Now, what was wrong about this approach is that I was more concerned about the format and presenting the message that would be perceived as intelligent than communicating the content. If I want the recipient to understand the message, I must present it using a code book that they have. You must help reduce the noise. Otherwise, like our sign here, something may get lost in translation. Now we can't talk about communication without at least touching on the wonderful world of email. In spite of all of its marvels, email is a medium with limitations. It does not communicate emotion or body language. People consistently attribute emotion and tone to email messages that may or may not have been intended by the sender. Additionally, we are typically are less polite and respectful in our email communication how often have you received a message and muttered to yourself, I bet they wouldn't say that to my face? And as Co Co Copernicus so aptly pointed out, as a matter of fact, the world revolves around me. We are experts at rejecting our own emotional perspective in interpreting messages. As such, emails are routinely perceived as more negative than the sender intends because we are placing our own emotional biases and attributing our own feelings towards them. So what can we do? It may sound basic, but take the time to highlight phrases, use expressive language, throw in an emoji, now I admit I struggled with this when it was first pointed out to me. I considered email just another tool to transmit a message and could not understand why I should have to incorporate superfluous language into my purely factual communications. But here's the secret sauce. It's not about you. Additionally, email can easily contribute to stress and a feeling of overload. It doesn't function well in ambiguous situations. So despite a trend to the opposite, in a world where I receive emails from people asking if it's okay to call, I dare you to be different. I challenge you to skip the text, stop typing that message and just pick up the phone. Or when it's safe and possible to meet again, meet with someone face to face, have a coffee and engage in conversation. Your inbox and your brain will thank you. Those quick touch-based conversations are how we build relationships and develop deeper and more meaningful connections, which inevitably make us better employees, team members, and leaders. Now that we've established the importance of communication, we can use it to look at the next element, delegation. To be an effective leaders, like these yaks, you must learn to share the load. Apologies for the blurriness of the photo. I uh, blame the altitude sickness. One of the most challenging aspects of early career leadership is that your role is now not to produce work through yourself. It is to produce work through others. If you fail to learn delegation, you will quickly become overwhelmed and you will not have enough time to adequately lead and support your team effectively. The more you share the load, the more time you will have for your staff. I would encourage you to think of the delegation of tasks to others or even to yourself as opportunities. Even the de delegation of the most basic tasks in an organization can present unforeseen positive or negative outcomes, depending on your outlook. Let me start off by telling you a little story about a task that should have been delegated, but was not. Some time ago, I was working in a small research and development department for a medical device company. We were developing point of care technology using uh, microosmotic pumps for a smart card diagnostic test. At the time, microosmotic pumps were not as common as they are today. 
For those of you who are unfamiliar with this type of technology, an osmotic pump relies on osmotic pressure using a semi-permeable membrane to draw fluid into a zone, which then displaces the solution currently occupying that space, typically pushing it through a controlled orifice. Today, microosmotic pumps are now commonly used as a controlled drug delivery system. However, using these pumps in our method of application was unique at the time. It was a small firm and we had a venture capitalist touring to consider investment. Uh, here's where I get into the task that should have been delegated, but was not. Instead of asking one of the R&D team members, which consisted of two engineers and two scientists to provide a tour of the lab, our senior VP of business development decided to do a personal tour with the venture capitalists and indicated little desire to have assistance from the technical team. And while I trust this individual was an excellent business development officer, they lacked a specific technical background. The unfortunate tour guide entered the area with a, the potential investor who presumably had some information on what they were looking at. And it was not long before into the tour before our unwitting protagonist was posed questions that he did not understand. And to a mixed response of delight and horror, the laboratory staff watched with rapt attention as the VP of business development demonstrated a pumping action akin to that of an antique fire bellow um, as a demonstration for our microosmotic pump system. As you may suspect, the two pumps work somewhat differently. Suffice it to say, the tour did not go well. Uh, that's to say everyone was disappointed and the organization overall would have fared better um, if this particular task had been delegated or at a minimum a joint venture with those with the requisite technical expertise. So how do we effectively share the load? I'd like to remind you of the expression, that's not my monkey. Picture an employee running to your office and saying, we have a problem. Take a minute for me and think about that word, we. The employee proceeds to describe the problem to you and you stare at them, fully engrossed in the details of this new challenge, like the action-oriented, solution-focused engineer you are, you rake your brain for solutions, cycling through your copious mental Rolodex, diving your hand to the bottom of your toolbox for just the right wrench you inevitably say, let me think about that and get back to you. With this statement, the project has stalled while you formulate a solution your employee leaves and has just dropped the respective monkey on your shoulders. I'd like you to go back to the use of the word we. The next time someone presents you as a leader or manager with a problem, consider is this really a we problem Will offloading that problem from your staff accelerate or stall the solution? What should your role in this situation really be? Does your staff have all the tools to formulate a solution? Do they really need your wrench? If they don't have all the tools, why not? And how can they be provided? If they do, what's the risk in flipping the we problem back to the employee and saying, thank you for bringing this to my attention. Can you tell me about the solutions you have come up with to address this? The next time you find yourself in this situation, I would urge you to follow the advice of the one minute manager. All monkeys should be handled at the lowest organizational level consistent with their welfare. The next time your staff member tries to drop a monkey off on your shoulders, allow your staff to retain control. People need to be empowered to act to solve problems. Part of your role as a leader is providing your staff with the tools and training to perform their jobs. Responsibility can only be developed if people are given responsibility. Just because we can solve a problem faster, more efficiently, or in just the way we like, does not mean you should take that opportunity away from your team. Give them the opportunity to grow. They may in fact surprise you. This does not mean that you are fully off the hook. You are responsible to provide your team with the tools necessary to do their jobs. If you find yourself hesitating at this, ask yourself the following questions. What's holding you back? 
what are you afraid will happen if you are not directly involved in this project or solution? Once you have the answers to those questions, you can work to resolve them and transfer responsibility. Remember, as a leader, it is your responsibility to delegate work, but still remain in control of the outcome of that work. The greatest compliment that you can receive from one of your staff or team members is that they feel supported and empowered. Will delegation be easy? No. Will it feel uncomfortable telling other people what to do? Quite possibly. Will pr the pressure of leadership always feel like a walk in the park? Absolutely not. Sometimes, like this durian, it will straight up stink. But your role and your privilege is to lead people into who and what they should become. Pressure is a privilege, and we who have worked hard to be given the opportunity to lead others should embrace that challenge. Because if you can get past the smellier bits, just like this durian, it's pretty tasty on the inside. All this to say that just because you move into a leadership or management position does not mean you get to avoid the nitty gritty. Do not let your pompacity get the better of you. Continue to roll up those sleeves. Speaking of people rolling up their sleeves, when I think of authentic leadership, I think of Jacinda, Jacinda Ardern, the, president, the Prime Minister of New Zealand. Crisis after crisis, Prime Minister Ardern breathes on authenticity. From the devastating earthquakes in Wellington, shootings in Christchurch, to the COVID-19 pandemic, Prime Minister Ardern presents an image of what it means to be an authentic leader. In the words of Helen Clark, New Zealand's Prime Minister from 1999 to 2008, Ardern is a natural and empathetic communicator who doesn't preach at people, but instead signals that she is standing with them. They may think, well, I don't quite understand why the government did that, but I know she's got our back. So what is it that makes people perceive Jacinda Ardern and others like her as so authentic? And how can we integrate that into our own practice? First, let's look at what it means to be authentic. To some people, it could mean to thine own self be true. William Shakespeare. This quote comes up often in authenticity presentations, but it's somewhat lacking. If you pop authenticity into Google, you'll be inundated with thousands of books, seminars, courses on how to be more authentic. Authenticity has been talked about for hundreds of years and its meaning and interpretation has evolved. So I'd like to give you my perspective on what an authentic leader looks like. Authenticity is knowing what your values are but also being open to questioning them. Sometimes people are put into a position of leading others and they become afraid of being perceived as inauthentic, of sacrificing their values and integrity. They don't wanna look like those guys that came before them who were of course less sincere, did not work nearly as hard and were handed their roles because they were inevitably more political or knew just the right people. As Professor Ibera of the London School of Business states, um, this hesitation drives people to retreat into their most conservative selves because we can morally justify our most conservative self as being authentic. Does retreating into your most conservative self help you grow, help you become the person you are meant to be and help your organization thrive as a result? Absolutely not. In contrast to William Shakespeare's version of authenticity, be true to yourself, I prefer the interpretation of the humanist psychologists like Maslow. They look at authenticity from a self-actualizing perspective. Professor Ibera argues that authenticity is not a trait, not something you have or don't have. Life like your career is a process of continuous learning and development. And like all things, learning can be uncomfortable. It does not always feel great to have to exercise skills that you are not fully at ease with yet. Thinking of this, I ask that you do not let trying to be authentic inhibit your growth. Let it be what you yourself can do. It does not mean remaining stagnant, deeply embedded into what you have been, those skills got you where you are. 
Now it's time to cross the bridge into what you could be. So take a deep breath and cross the bridges that are presented to you, even if they mean you must stretch who and what you are and look a little bit intimidating at first glance. I think Jacinda Ardern, like many political leaders today, has been presented with some very narrow bridges and her forthcoming empathetic and authentic style has served her and her country well in navigating them. And that style of leadership was rewarded last fall when Jacinda was re-elected by an overwhelming majority and will continue to lead her country. Now, just like politicians, we all must make decisions on a daily basis. What to eat for breakfast, what route to take to work, what project to work on next. Decision-making is the process of making choices among alternatives with the intention of moving towards some desired state of affairs. Approximately 400 years ago, European philosophers, including Descartes, emphasized that, and I quote, the ability to make logical decisions is one of the most important attributes to human beings. As engineers, we typically like to consider ourselves logical beings. We evaluate information against an objective and make a decision to move forward. This is a calculated view of decision-making and best represented by uh, the rational choice paradigm. Like most engineering challenges, we must first spend time defining the problem before jumping into a decision. A well-defined problem can save you time and money. There's no value in doing efficiently, which should not have been done in the first place. This can be particularly challenging for managers who are often evaluated on their ability to make quick decisions. An example of a poorly defined problem could be, we need more time to prepare for the upcoming audit. This is not a description of a problem. The actual problem may be that we do not have an efficient filing system. And in the pre-audit, we have noticed our files are disorganized or not accessible in a timely manner. Additionally, when making decisions, we tend to use our own frame of reference. We tend to frame things with our own mental models, creating visual or relational images uh, to the external world, which we use to fill in information when we don't have um, all of the uh, information on the problem. Furthermore, um, this is a, we have a, as a coping, coping mechanism, we tend to block out negative information that does not suit our purpose. So how can you utilize your skills and your team skills to better define problems and subsequently develop more effective solutions and make better decisions? Primarily, be aware of your own biases and blind spots. Listen to your team, take in alternative perspectives and question the status quo. There's a wonderful book and video developed by Simon Sinek um, that focuses on leaders speaking last. If you enter a room with a solution in hand and quickly tell it to your team, after which you ask them to present their solutions, it will be exceedingly difficult for them to bring their own ideas forward, knowing that you have already landed on one. Even if it takes considerable willpower to hold back, be the last to speak. While it may ultimately be your responsibility to make the decision, it is also your responsibility to understand the problem fully, to take in information that you may not have and listen to your team. On that note, find someone who tells you the truth and listen to them. Just because they may have opposing ideas to you does not mean that you should discount them. There's untapped value in division they may not have the same blind spots that you have. Also, it would be worth noting that the two gentlemen in this photo did not take in all the information available when they entered this fast creek backwards. Um, when they finally made the decision to turn around, they became firmly stuck. However, don't despair. This was not a permanent state and they did eventually get out of this quandary and are now both very successful decision makers. One is a practicing MD and the other is a professor of health informatics. It's difficult to talk about decision-making without touching on the role of emotions, uh, the role that emotions and intuitions play. If those alarm bells go off, you need to search a little bit deeper. It is not inappropriate to acknowledge those gut feelings, which cause us to question or evaluate information when we are making a decision. 
let's just lean into a real example. If you're not already, everyone in these seminars has the potential to be in leadership or management role at some point in their careers. Picture that you're presented with two contracts, two organizations that you want to work with. You meet with both companies, they give you similar information, cost of production or service, delivery time, etc. But something about one company leaves you feeling a bit disconcerted and you can't pinpoint why. Is this enough information to choose not to work with company A over company B? Absolutely not. But it should be enough information for you to ask more questions. Trust that this rapid, non-conscious analytical process called intuition may be picking up on something that you are not yet aware of. Why then can we not rely on our emotions and intuition exclusively in decision making? The problem is that our emotions and intuitions are not always based in well-grounded mental models. We are biased by our own lived experience. While I would encourage you to incorporate the exploration of these feelings into your decision-making process, the final outcome should always be a holistic view of the situation at hand. A note on decision-makings. Early in my career, I was working as an engineering technician at a nuclear pharmaceutical facility. I was given the task of using an orbital welder to seal one end of nuclear control rods. The other end would later be sealed in a hot cell after the rods were filled with cobalt-59, which was converted to cobalt-60 once the rods were placed in the reactor. One task, one thing to do for four months. I was 19 years old. And while the job paid well, it was not terribly exciting. I was shown into a room stacked floor to ceiling with boxes filled with unwelded capsules. I asked if there were more or any more coming in and was told, no, this is the annual supply. I was told the average employee welded about 60 capsules a day and that this task would likely last me the duration of my term. Instead of settling into the monotony of the role or subjugating myself to my welding fate, I took this delegated task and its perceived monotony and decided to reframe it as a challenge, as an opportunity. I knew the only way I would be able to switch off this task and do something more exciting was to finish it, to run out of rods before I ran out the clock. So I spent the first week focusing on my mise en place, refining the process, reducing the time to switch out material and move from one rod to the next and increase production by greater than 100% to 125 rods a day. Now this got noticed from a few vantage points. Primarily the VP of manufacturing was thrilled um, as I powered through the material and finished the job months ahead of schedule. On the flip side, the employees who typically perform this task were less than enthused and went as far as to tell my manager to slow me down. Thankfully, he did the opposite and presented me with more interesting and diverse opportunities as I demonstrated initiative, creativity, and good old hard work. When you change what you believe, you change what you do. As a junior employee, I had been given a task that others saw as punitive and boring Change your perspective. Turn your challenges into opportunities. So let's review what we've talked about today. Make sure you tailor your message to those that will be receiving it. Be cognizant of your own emotional contribution and attribution, especially when communicating digitally by text or email. Delegate, delegate, delegate. Take on all tasks and challenges with a view to the opportunities that they can create. Find inspiring leaders, explore what about them inspires you and try to emulate it. Leave room for yourself to grow. Learning like leadership is a journey, not a destination. And finally, gather information and make those decisions. That is after all why they pay you the big bucks. So what happens when you do all of that? You build solid partnerships with an empowered team. I'd like to wrap up by giving you an example of a small but exceptional team. I took this photo at Base Camp Everest. The peak of Everest sits at just over 29,000 feet. At this elevation, climbers describe the lack of oxygen like running on a treadmill while breathing through a straw. 
The people sleeping in these tents are about to embark on an incredible journey where they will inevitably need to rely on others. Almost 70 years ago, two men, New Zealander Edmund Hillary and Nepalese Tenzing Norgay, broke down the barriers of culture, circumstance and communication to become the first two people to summit Everest. And what I find truly incredible is almost 70 years later, to this day, no one knows which man set foot on the summit of Everest first. Empower the people around you and you will find yourself rising to great heights together. I'd just like to take a minute and thank uh, and acknowledge all of our amazing sponsors. Without their, these generous organizations, it would be impossible to provide the engaging content that NEM Ontario has organized this month. So hats off to all of you. And as we wrap up, I'd like to wish you all health and happiness during this difficult time. You can see my contact information at the bottom of the slide if you wish to reach out. And as we end our time together, I'd like to leave you with this final thought. As you stand on the precipice of your next great challenge, from whatever vantage point you sit at in your organization, what is within your locus of control? What can you do to influence, motivate, enable, and enable others to contribute towards the effectiveness and success of your team or organization? Thank you. Thank you so much, Kim. That was amazing. Uh, for everyone that's joined, we've had quite a quite a crowd joining us today as well, Kim. We've had over 70 people uh, join us live. And as I said at the beginning, the session will be recorded and available on NEM Ontario's YouTube channel uh, in the future so people can catch up and re-watch this very valuable information. Um, so anyone that's uh, joining us, if you have any questions for Kim, please do take a moment now to type them into the chat box. And I will be asking uh, questions directly in this portion. Uh, before we wrap up. Um, stick around for those questions and also for our poll question that's coming at the end. Um, Kim, like we were talking about just before we came live, uh, I have had the pleasure of watching this presentation twice now. And uh, I just love the, th the takeaways from this session is so fantastic. And I have often been heard to say, not my monkey uh, in my office, because I am the person that kind of people come to you and it's very easy to want to help everybody but like you say, it doesn't build that kind of teamwork. It doesn't build that responsibility within the team. So I just, I love that piece. I constantly take that away. So thank you so much from me personally uh, for the takeaways from this session. Um, now, first question that we had uh, was actually regarding Monica. Um, was Monica okay with the white water uh, floating? It sounded quite a terrible situation. Uh, so we just she wanted to check. Completely fine, completely <laughs> fine. We have paddled again since we're planning Thank trips you. for the summer. So, you know, it, it was a, a surprising experience, but uh, everyone's got to start somewhere. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. And when you started that, I'm a, I'm a big white water rafting fan myself, and I knew exactly what you meant about that float position. And uh, yes, the visual that you created there was quite fantastic. So thank you. I'm glad to hear that Monica was good. Uh, so here's a question from Pat. What's your best tip for reviewing your own communication in a critical way to catch any blind spots that you might have um, or things that you might have misunderstood? Um, I, I take a minute. Um, so if someone's communicating to me and I'm not, uh, I try not to process my response while they are speaking, uh, which, which we all do. Mm -hmm. We are generally terrible active listeners. Um, so tell yourself to close your mind down and, and really listen. You know, what are they saying? Am I understanding them? And even as basic as repeating what they've said, you know, did I understand this correctly? Um, and if you don't have a response right away, that's okay. It's okay to say, I need to think about this for a moment. Um, don't jump to saying something just to fill the space. That's a, that's a great tip. And I, I admit that I agree with that. I'm a terrible active listener. I, I'm constantly thinking about how I'm going to respond. And I, I really, yes, that's a really good piece of advice. Um, next question comes from Nick. Uh, he says, you seem to have such a vast knowledge base. What advice do you have to optimize learning if you don't have much time to commit to it exclusively? Um, I read a lot. <laughs> so I know that takes time, but audiobooks are wonderful. You can listen to them while you drive, podcasts, etc. Um, and, and just say yes to experiences. Um, there's a lot of things that I've jumped into uh, 
um, maybe not having all the background, just like poor Monica, um, <laughs> when we enter the white water, but um, just opening yourself up to, to new and exciting opportunities. Perfect. And I know you mentioned that you read a lot. Do you have any particular books, um, audio books, podcasts, or anything that you'd like to recommend to people that you found particularly useful? Um, I'm putting are, you on the spot here. Yeah, there are so <laughs> many. Um, or any authors? This, you know, so so there's a book I really enjoy. It's more about life than leadership in general, but kind of leading yourself. Um, mm -hmm. It's quite old now, but uh, Randy Posh wrote a book um, called The Last Lecture. It's a very small uh, novel, but I, I really enjoy some of the lessons that he demonstrates there. Perfect. Always looking for the next good read. So that's a great, uh, great recommendation. Okay. Um, question from Diana. Have you found someone, have you ever found someone that's really hard to communicate with? And how did you deal with that situation without completely losing your marbles? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, all the time. Right. But we have to consider that I might also be difficult to communicate with. Ooh. They might desperately be trying to get a message to me and I'm not receiving it. Um, I don't know how to help you not lose your marbles. Uh, <laughs> find an activity that you can get rid of some stress on. I do a lot of hiking, obviously a lot of wilderness travel. <laughs> but um, just just take a moment and try and uh, appreciate their uh, their position and be empathetic. And I know that's hard because there are always going to be people that we don't, we don't gel with, that we don't really, we don't really get along with and maybe communication struggles between them. Um, but everyone has skills and assets um, and we just need to find, find those pieces of people and draw them out. That's yeah, I absolutely agree with that. There's always going to be some people that are trickier than others and people that perhaps aren't on your wavelength. Yeah, that's a really, really tough one to deal with. Um, question about uh, just kind of advice that you would give to somebody. So if you were to give any advice to someone in an early career leadership role, what would it be? Um, in an early career leadership role, I would I would seek out a mentor. Um, I have regularly met with uh, mentors throughout my career, and even asking strangers. So you know, executives in your own organization or sister organizations, um, people like to help, and we cannot all make our all the mistakes. So we can learn the lessons from others. Um, so seek out someone that can can lend you a hand, and then pay it forward. Uh, Manitoba has a fantastic mentorship program for uh, female uh, engineers, and I'm proud to be involved in that and find it really valuable for the students and for myself, because we're all certainly learning from each other. Perfect. Yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, I've got another question here coming in from David. Um, this is a kind of a situational question. Uh, so he says, I worked in an organization where customer service would prevent engineers from speaking directly with customers in the belief that they could not be trusted to communicate effectively. Uh, the result was at best a slowing filter on customer concerns to at worst um, outliers as customer service um, interpreted by the customer. How could anyone deal with such organizational behavior in that structure? Well, that's challenging because the bigger and bigger your organization gets, the more specialized all of our roles become. Um, I mean, you could present your your concerns uh, to to leadership, to the executive. Um, that <laughs> it, it is really difficult. If if you wanted to speak to customers directly and thought you it would be more efficient, perhaps offer the option of engaging in a conference with a customer service rep present, or inquire as to why. You know, what are your concerns exactly? If I respond to them directly, um, maybe there's something you're not aware of. Um, so just start asking questions, but it is hard to move bureaucratic systems once they're in place. Yes, indeed. Those systemic <laughs> kind of protocols, right? I think everyone has experience of those ones for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, question from Nick. How do you determine when to distance yourself from a potentially toxic person, coworker or employee um, if they're still God contributors to a project? Um, well, I think... One of the things we all struggle with is sometimes we, we want to be liked. We want to be liked so much. So we try and be friends with all of our coworkers and, and you don't need to be, um, especially if you're a leader or a manager, you don't need to be liked, you need to be respected. Um, and sometimes you're making decisions that people don't agree with. Um, there will be toxic or difficult to work with employees in every environment. Um, my best recommendation is when you're, when you're working with these people, stay calm. You cannot control anyone else's behavior. 
you can only control yours. And I find it really does de-escalate situations. People find it very uncomfortable if you don't engage them, if they're there for, <laughs> for a fight. Um, so you calmly listen, acknowledge, and then just move on with your day. Oh, I love that. That's such a great piece of advice for all situations, I feel, as well. Yeah. As a parent, I feel that's a great piece of advice, too. Um, question from Christopher. Any recommendations on corrections done during peer review of co-workers for whom English may be a second or third language? Oh, language is difficult for me because my language is so poor. I'm at best unilingual with a little bit of French on the side. Um, I think it's it's hard because uh, I've had the the wonderful opportunity to live in in a place where I didn't speak uh, the language. So um, not being able to understand and have those those quick little discussions, um, I would maybe discuss with your coworker um, what their thoughts and feelings are and ask them how how um, how they feel about you making these corrections. Um, you know, are they perceiving it as an insult or is it, is it not? Is it just, um, just accepted? Um, but, but talk to them about it, just be open and frank. I think transparency is, is a big thing. And sometimes we don't want to, uh, we don't want to say things because we're trying to be so polite, particularly as Canadians, everyone walks on eggshells. But <laughs> if you just bring something forward, then it might not be um, as, as big as, as you're making it. Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's very true. Very true. And you can never quite 100% know what someone else is thinking, right? Mm -hmm. Until you ask. Um, and Pat just commented, for sure, no need for unsolicited feedback, especially critical. Ask if somebody wants feedback and it potentially explain why feedback may help them. So, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, that's a great, uh, great comment, Pat. So I'm not seeing any more questions coming in right now. Um, if you do have any more questions, feel free to quickly type them in. Um, otherwise, I'm going to quickly launch a poll right now. Um, so everyone is going to see that pop up on their screens. And as we just want to know what you think about this session. So this is a poll taken on behalf of uh, NEM Ontario. So we want to know what you think. Um, did you learn or deepen existing knowledge, skills or values in today's session? Uh, would you say that learning from this event will help be helpful for you or your community or your organization? And would you be uh, willing or thinking about attending another online NEM Ontario event? Obviously, we are becoming right to the end of National Engineering Month, which is March. So tomorrow is the last day. Um, but this is something that we're going to be potentially looking at moving forward. So um, if you found it useful, definitely click that, uh, that last one and let us know which of those apply to you uh, so that we can kind of use this moving forward. I'm going to keep that open for a couple more seconds. I've seen a lot of you have voted already. Thank you so much for your engagement. Um, and then uh, we're gonna wrap up and say goodbye to you folks. So I'm gonna open it for three more seconds. Three, two, get your votes in now. One, there we go. Perfect. Well, thank you so much everybody for joining us. I'm just gonna check. We have no more questions, Kimberly, but a lot of very positive comments coming through. So I'd like to echo that as well. So Kim, thank you so much for your excellent presentation today. and. Uh, Great questions. Audience, thank you so much for those wonderful questions. Those were fantastic. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Um, I really appreciate people engaging in the yes, conversation. So yeah. engaging. Yes, yeah, wonderful. A lot of people saying it was a great presentation, really useful. And thank you so much. So on behalf of NEM Ontario, uh, Engineers, Geoscientists of Manitoba, presenter Kimberly Dodds and myself, I'd like to say thank you all once again for attending and for your excellent engagement today. Be sure to check out NEM Ontario's YouTube channel in the coming weeks where these presentations will be posted for you to re-watch and share if you would like. And on behalf of everybody, thank you and have a wonderful rest of your day and happy Easter for those who celebrate. Thanks for joining everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye, -bye.